Hey, welcome back to Pilot Lounge. I'm Paul Harrop, and joining us over the internet is Tom Haynes and Warren Morningstar. Hey, guys. Hey, Paul. Hello, Paul. So you guys had a pretty cool assignment last week. You went down to Florida to cover the uh, return to space from America, and you flew down there GA. Kind of tell me about the trip. That sounds really awesome. Well, uh, I, I thought it was great to, to get to get out and travel again, since so many of us have been locked up for months now and unable to do business travel. Things in Florida have opened up enough that felt like it was a safe thing to do with reasonable precautions. So, uh, yeah, we, we hauled uh, my bonanza out of the barn and uh, dusted that thing off. <laughs> and uh, away we went, loaded it up with... Uh, you know, a plethora of video gear, which Warren can't seem to leave home without. Uh, I know, I have to have all my toys. Warren, you're, you're definitely a techie. Uh, I thought I was bad with video accoutrement, and then I went to work for you, and uh, you've got every gadget <laughs> under the sun. What all did you take down there to document it? Uh, well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, we had a, you know, I had my uh, my good camera, my C200. I had a, I had a pocket Osmo, and a, you know, tripod and some, some light stands to hold some other things. And, you know, just, right. I was fairly light load for, for Well, it, you know, it's an A36. You can load a lot of stuff in there. And, and I mean, just looking at the video that you got, what an incredible opportunity to go down there and document it for our AOPA audience. Uh, what was it like to, to see that in person? I'm, I'm such a huge space geek. And uh, it, to me, there's something even more special about you know, this is a capsule on a rocket. This goes back to like the Apollo era. What's that like in person? Well, um, and to a certain extent, there's it's it's like a lot of other government sort of things. It's a lot of hurry up and wait. Uh, we had to be on site on Wednesday, which of course turns out to be the aborted day, right? But we had to be out there uh, at an Air Force base uh, location uh, about um, what was it worn about? five hours ahead of the launch, scheduled launch or something like that, pretty close. Five hours. And Yeah, so, and then they uh, got us a bunch of media together and, and then we caravaned in our vehicles uh, clear across the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, I don't know where all we went, but we were all over the, all over the place till they finally got us to an, actually what was interesting, a new viewing area that they hadn't used before. Uh, but it was like uh, about five miles across the water to the site, which sounds like a long ways, but uh, considering that the uh, other media and those great shots that you normally see are typically at least three and a half miles away. So uh, it wasn't bad at all, but it was a new location. And the reason they had to have it was because of COVID and they couldn't accommodate the usual amount of media, media in the normal space. So they opened up this additional place. But anyhow, so we, we hung around uh, and sat through some thunderstorms all day Wednesday, didn't we, Warren? Yeah, it was it, it was nice that we were, that our cars were handy because we'd be standing out there. The storm would roll through. We'd get back into the car and, and wait out the storm. Or if it just got too hot, we'd get back in the car with the air conditioning on. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of hurry up and wait. And then we got uh, the, the countdown. They got to a minus uh, T minus 40 and they fueled the rocket. And we were thinking, OK, we're maybe going to make it even though the weather was a bit iffy. We could see the weather starting to clear. Um, in fact, there, and I have a time lapse of showing the, the weather moving through, and it was getting pretty clear. But at uh, T minus 17, they scrubbed because there were two of the weather factors that uh, they didn't meet, uh, both of them having to do with electrical activity, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to be yeah. in an electrical storm sitting in a giant lightning rod filled with... Uh, <laughs> jet fuel or uh, filled with rocket fuel so uh you mentioned covid and you know business travel that's something that that we as aopa employees have had uh to kind of put on hold you guys are really the, the first to go down together uh talk to me about some of the precautions you took what what did you guys do to stay safe within the bonanza together well, I took, uh, first of all, the, the Bonanza has been sort of sitting there for weeks. Uh, and so I, I wasn't too worried about there any being any live uh, virus still in inside the airplane. But nonetheless, uh, I took some Lysol wipes and I wiped everything down um, while Warren was kind of gathering gear together outside the airplane. Uh, we then loaded the airplane and um, and then, you know, took our respective seats, uh, wore masks uh, quite a bit of the time, or certainly Warren did. And... Um, you know, and so that was 
sort of the precautions we took in the airplane. We got to the FBO. We had a fuel stop in Florence, South Carolina. Uh, wore masks there as we were going into the FBO and dealing with staff there. Um, and then, um, surprisingly, when we got to Florida, there weren't a lot of people using masks. The restaurants were, were open, uh, which was a pleasant surprise for us because here in Maryland, for the, we're still pretty much locked down and not able to go to restaurants, or at least we weren't until this week. So the idea of sitting down at a restaurant and having a menu and having them bring you food on a plate instead of like a styrofoam container, that was kind of nice. Um, but staff uh, at the restaurant, in some cases, were wearing masks. Most they did have table space to park most of the time. So it was, uh, we only felt reasonably safe. Um, but anytime you're out among people, there is a risk, no doubt about it. Yeah. Although, I mean, I felt reasonably secure in the aircraft because, you know, it's summertime, we're going to Florida. So every vent in the aircraft is open. So right. you, you were keeping the airflow going as, as high as we can in, in the aircraft. And, you know, both Tom and I were healthy before we left. Uh, you know, we'd taken our temperatures. We knew we were, uh, not, neither of us had a fever. And that was doubly confirmed when we went to the vehicle assembly bill to see the president and the vice president because the Secret Service was checking us over good, too. Yeah. Yeah. Me twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you got to kind of look twice at you. You're one of those shifty kind of guys. Yeah. I like to think of it I just look hot, but... That's another story, but... Well, I'm just going to leave that one right alone. But, uh, so how was the system? Was it, did it seem like there was an uptick in traffic? I mean, it was pretty desolate for a few weeks. Did it sound like there were other airplanes in the air with you? Yeah, I mean, I thought the trip down and back sounded relatively normal. I've made that trip to Florida dozens and dozens of times in the last 25, 30 years. Um, and I thought it felt fairly normal from an air traffic control standpoint uh, in route. But, man, when we got to Florida, it was busy as all get out. I mean, there were, there were airplanes everywhere on the ADS-B displays and uh, felt like there was just uh, anyhow, a, lot, a lot of people out flying. Didn't, didn't you agree, Warren? Oh, yeah. Um, c coming out of Orlando, uh, approach frequency was, uh, was almost saturated. And what was interesting is that I would say the majority of them were uh, training flights, a lot yeah. of had the call signs from the various flight schools in the area. Well, that's encouraging. I'm, I'm happy to see that. I know I got to return to GA flying over the weekend, and there was just a ton of VFR traffic out. So maybe we're seeing a, a little bit of the return to normal. And uh, speaking of returning to flight, uh, you know, this is a historic moment that you guys went down and documented. Uh, this is the first launch from American soil since STS-135 a decade ago. Uh, what was the sense around it? I mean, was there the, the national pride that you'd expect? I mean, I know the president was there, but uh, this is a big deal for the United States. Yeah, it really was. The, um, we were with, with a bunch of media, so, you know, no, normally you expect media to be kind of skeptical and, and not all that enthused or showing a lot of enthusiasm, enthusiasm maybe for something like this. But so we were scattered out along this uh, uh, roadway on the grass, uh, oh. watching the it's site, going. and there was genuine excitement among all the shooters uh, who were pointing cameras in that direction. Uh, a lot of anticipation oh, as the final moments counted Look down, and excitement on Saturday, go, baby, go. and uh, a lot of applause and cheers when it actually happened. So I think uh, even jaded media people were pretty excited about the idea of this incredible launch and returning humans to flight from American soil. It's a pretty, pretty interesting story. And there were, a lot of, there were a lot of people out watching it. I mean, we, the, the traffic was incredibly heavy after the, yeah. both after the scrub and after the launch. And you could see people with their lawn chairs and, and, fo and even some of the folks had American flags. So, I mean, there, there was a lot of interest for sure. Yeah. So, Warren, I have to ask, I know you've spent a lot of the time, as you do when, we're, when you're a videographer, you got your, your head in the camera. So I want you to describe what it felt like. What, what was the, the sensory uh, input to your, your body when that rocket launched? Well, you know, for, first you see, the, you see the, sm the flame and the smoke and you see the rocket starting to ascend and there's no feeling. You don't hear anything. You don't feel anything. Um, and then... Uh, I've got to go back and look at the video and time it and see how long it actually took the sound to get to us. Some were probably in the vicinity of 15 seconds or so. Uh, you start to hear it. And then it starts to, you start to feel it. 
and then there is this incredible sound tom describes it as if as ripping the atmosphere apart and that's yeah that's what it really sounds like it's just it's just amazing and there was certainly there there was a strong temptation to get away from the viewfinder and look at it for real but you know one has to do one's job oh of course <laughs> So, Tom, you, you guys got to, to see Kennedy Space Center and, and see some VVIPs that were there on hand for the launch. Yeah, actually, we were part of a select group of media. Again, because of COVID, they had really limited ability to accommodate media for the presidential uh, part, part of it. And so, but we somehow got elected, selected. And so right after the launch, I mean, we, we, we'd had cars pre-positioned on the roadway. We had everything ready to immediately tear down after the launch, threw everything in the back of the car, and went traipsing back across the complex over to a big parking lot where they loaded us on a bus with other media and took us over to the Kennedy Space Center to the uh, Vehicle Assembly Building, which is that iconic, huge building at the Kennedy Space Center with the enormous American flag on it from which they assembled all the Saturn rockets and the, and the shuttle and, and everything else and rolled it out to uh, Launch Complex 39A. So um, that's where the president was speaking, going to be speaking. So as media, we got there early. We we're up on risers and uh, the uh, NASA administrator came out and really got the crowd going, uh, excited. And he, he did a nice job of giving a lot of credit to the NASA staff and to SpaceX. And then Vice President Pence came out, also laid out an interesting future. Um, he's head of the uh, Space Council that, that uh, President Trump put in place a couple of years ago. And uh, then the president came out and spoke. He acknowledged, interestingly, Elon Musk, the head of SpaceX, who was in the audience. And Elon Musk uh, got up and just went crazy with the crowd. He was jumping around, hands in the air. Um, it, it was it was fun to see. He got the biggest applause of anybody that day. Uh, so it was, it was just, just fun to be there for that moment and see the excitement that he had. Yeah, no social distancing there with uh, Elon. He, <laughs> he was hugging folks. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he was primed to jump out of that seat. So what what do you guys think that this means for, for the future of, uh, if we talk the big, big picture, aerospace, aviation, general aviation, a subset of that. What do you think commercial space coming from, you know, essentially GA aircraft, uh, the, the route to commercial spacecraft sort of began with, uh, through TAN designs and through Spaceship One, and now it's fully developed from a couple other programs. How do you think that'll trickle back down to the light GA world uh, that now that this is a, a, a thing that's going to be happening? Well, I think it's a great, a, a great question. I, no, no doubt this is a turning point in space travel in that private companies are now coming on strong. Boeing is right behind and there are other companies, you know, you've got uh, uh, Bezos with his program, and you've got Virgin Galactic of commercial space coming uh, right along to probably launching passengers into near-Earth orbit, um, potentially as soon as later this year. So a lot of things are going to happen in the next year or two relative to commercial space, and a lot of it has to do with driving down the costs compared to what it cost when the government was doing it, and use reusable uh, components and that sort of thing. So we're going to see a lot more space activity. Um, SpaceX's stated goal is that they're launching every day and that they have something like a 24-hour turn uh, on some of these rockets. Hard to believe, but, um, you know, it was hard to believe not that long ago that uh, that they'd be successful in launching, you know, people into space again using private contractors. And here we are. So um, I think from that standpoint, we're going to see it's a real turning point for for space. Um, I think it's it's probably quite a ways before we're going to see anything trickle down to to general aviation, unless it unless it becomes some of the sort of the proper the materials properties that are used in some of these spacecraft that that might begin to find their ways first probably into experimental aircraft and then maybe ultimately into production airplanes as well. Um, that that's the thing I would see probably happening first. I think that bringing the cost down means that. As Tom says, there's going to be a lot more development in space. I mean, I was just reading today that the uh, we were paying the the Russians uh, 80 million dollars a seat for the launch on the Soyuz. Uh, Boeing, the, the contract with NASA, it's going to be 90 million a seat. 
but the contract with SpaceX is is uh, 50 million a seat, and SpaceX thinks they're going to get it cheaper than that once they get much into their cycle. But some of the things that we're going to see, is, uh, I think, are going to be some of the manufacturing advances that are going to come because of what they can do in microgravity. Um, you know, just things like um, there's you don't get a you don't get a sediment settle out in microgravity, and that changes the chemistry of the way things are made. And there are there are other things in in metallurgy that are different when you do it in space, and that's where I think we're going to see the advances as those kinds of things make their way back into the civilian world. Well, very cool. I'm uh, incredibly jealous that you guys got to go on that assignment. Uh, hope to get to come along on another one as America returns to launching from our own soil. What an incredible thing that you guys got to document. Tom Haynes and Warren Morningstar, thank you so much for uh, talking with us here on Pilot Lounge. And you can find the, uh, the full video on AOPA Live this week. Uh, congrats, guys. What a cool story. Thank you, Paul. See you around the office sometime in the future. Some, yeah, someday. Sometime. All right, see you guys. <laughs>